This is Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to Street Knowledge. I am Chris Graham, and I'm experimenting a bit here today. We're going to try to do a a live Facebook video along with the recorded podcast that we do. So kind of trying to kill two birds with one stone in a good way. And um, today the topic is sports and political activism. And, um, you know, this is one that, boy, it's easy to shy away from because you're going to offend roughly half the people who are watching or listening uh, guaranteed right off the bat uh, as you uh, t- tackle this topic. But I'm going to do it anyway. Don't really, you know, I'm, what's the difference? you gotta, you got to be out there. Um, and I guess we're all start. We're obviously talking about the take a knee movement in the NFL that has started to spread a little bit. Uh, at least one Major League Baseball player. So it's spreading to one sport with, with one player, the Oakland A's uh, rookie catcher. I imagine as the NBA gets ramped up, we're both uh, we're getting ready for the preseason, the regular season, not that far off. I would imagine that the um, the NBA will see uh, some uh, activity. In fact, I'd, I'd be very surprised if we don't see a lot of activity from NBA players in terms of political activism. So, uh, where do I come down on this? You know, if you read Augusta Free Press, you go to our Facebook page, you go to my Twitter account, you probably know pretty clearly where I come down on this personally, but I want to try to give both sides, so to speak, the, you know, the, the best benefit of the doubt. And I'll tell you, for me, where it comes down is it dates way back, actually, for me. I remember, I think it was back in the 80s, the, the famous comments attributed to, you know, then young NBA superstar Michael Jordan. Uh, you know, Jordan, of course, uh, his early years in the NBA before he won the six titles at the end of his career, uh, the, the young Jordan was a player who, even before he became the, the, the champion Jordan, was a great player. He was a scoring champion, uh, and uh, he sold shoes. He, 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 you know, the Air Jordan shoes came out his rookie year, and the, the commercials with Spike Lee, Mars Blackman, Michael Jordan, I mean, those famous commercials propelled a brand and really, you know, really propelled Nike uh, to a great degree. Nike was already taking over the marketplace, but those commercials really pushed Nike uh, up the leaderboard uh, in terms of shoes and sports apparel, and uh, there were people asking questions. Hey, Mike, you know you're a, you're an African American athlete. Uh, there was a, a contentious Senate election in North Carolina, his home state. Of course, he was a star at the University of North Carolina in his college days. He was a native of North Carolina from his high school days, and so there was a contentious Senate election. Uh, Jesse Helms, the the only way you can say it, the, the racist North Carolina senator, he made his name as a political commentator back in the 60s, um, talking about Negras uh, on his, you know, John Chancellor-like rantings uh, uh, on the local news back in the days. I mean, you know, that's that's how Helms made his, his way. He was an early race baiter using the media uh, like we see so many folks good at these days. Uh, but... Uh, uh, Jesse Helms was running against Harvey Gant, the then Charlotte mayor, Democrat, uh, and it was a close race. Helms eventually wins the race. Uh, but a question was asked of Michael Jordan at the time uh, of that Senate race. I believe it was the 88 Senate race. I hope I have that right. Uh, the question was, um, you know, Mike, are you going to get involved in this political race? And um, Jordan famously deflected, said that, uh, you know, hey, I, I'm not going to get involved in politics because Republicans buy shoes, too. And that's sort of for a generation, maybe a couple of generations of athletes, both uh, African-American, white, uh, defined the approach to politics, if you want to say approach to politics, because the approach to politics was stay away from it. Because, you know, for athletes, actually for celebrity endorsers too, the you know actors and other celebrities, now we have cable media pundit celebrities uh, – you have you have it's 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 threatening to your brand uh, if you're a, if you're an athlete or a um, or or an actor uh, to come out on one side or the other because hey you know not only do Republicans and Democrats all buy sneakers they also you know they also go to movies uh, they watch TV and so uh, the the way things have been done for the longest time. Has been to say, hey, we're you know we're gonna uh, we're gonna stay away from those politics things because we don't want to lose people who want, either want to buy our shoes or buy our our, our t-shirts or buy our hats. We're gonna go good all out here today. Um, 
who who want to go to our movies, buy tickets to our games. We're not going to do that. We're not going to we're not going to offend people. Um, so that's you know I'm I'm thinking back. I mean I, I'm bringing up the Michael Jordan from 1988 because that's a long time def- where where the 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 definition of approach for many celebrities, certainly athletes, uh, has you think. I mean because you know I. Somewhere here in in this room, this this my, my little broadcast studio I've created here uh, at the home office of West Free Press, um, I've got a Jackie Robinson jersey hanging up. That used to be the approach. Jackie Robinson, of course. I mean, gosh, the fact that Jackie Robinson even played Major League Baseball was was a protest to the then status quo. Uh, in 1947. Uh, coming up to the big leagues after playing in, uh, in the International League in Montreal in 1946 in the Brooklyn Dodgers organization. The very fact that Jackie Robinson played baseball uh, was a challenge uh, uh, to the to the system. Um, uh, I've also got a I've got a Colin Kaepernick jersey hanging up here uh, in, among the the relics of sports that I have in in my uh, in, in our studio here. And and that f- fast forward just to 2015, you know, so we had. We had the greats like Jackie Robinson, Muhammad Ali in the 60s, uh, famously uh, uh, just avoiding the, the draft uh, in the Vietnam War, saying he had no quarrel with no Viet Cong, I think is, is a close quote, uh, saying that he couldn't rightly justify going to fight a war overseas when African Americans didn't have equal rights at home. He took a lot of, obviously took a lot of abuse for that. He lost his heavyweight title. Uh, he was out of boxing for several years before returning. Uh, there were still people who uh, refused to refer to him as Muhammad Ali because his his uh, birth name Cassius Clay. He had won a, a, the World Boxing Title the first time as Cassius Clay. Uh, quite a few people refused to refer to him in any way other than Muhammad Ali, or excuse me, as Cassius Clay, for the longest time. Even after his career was over, he still had lots of holdouts who who said, "Hey, you know, you're Cassius Clay. You can change your name. You can't change your name." And um, Refused to acknowledge that. Bill Russell was an outspoken uh, uh, top athlete back in the 60s. Uh, but then, yeah, then for the longest time, athletes said, nope, not going to do it. You know, we make money on the field. And, of course, the funny thing is back in the 50s and 60s, 40s, 50s and 60s, athletes didn't make nearly as much money on the field of play or in the boxing ring or on the court or wherever the case may be uh, as they do now. And uh, they stood to lose money. They, the, the the money they stood to lose from endorsements back then uh, was was much more important. Not just for you know, well, I make you know, if I'm a top athlete now in the NBA or NFL, the top top guys can make ten, fifteen, twenty million dollars, thirty million dollars for some baseball players. Uh, you know, we're talking about guys uh, back in the the 40s, 50s, and 60s who who played their season and then worked jobs in the offseason. When I'm talking about working jobs, I'm talking about you know working in delivery. I think Jackie Robinson uh, uh, had a had a some sort of delivery route that he did in the offseason. He had guys selling stuff at furniture stores. I mean, you know, so so yeah, you know, not being able to endorse whatever opportunities came up, smoking you know the cigarette commercials and, and ads uh, to everything else that you could endorse. That was that was meaningful, but those guys still stood up and said, "Hey, you know, we're going to take a stand." Uh, so let's, you know, we had move ahead to twenty, actually twenty sixteen with with Colin Kaepernick, the the then San Francisco 49ers quarterback, uh, who decides in the re- in the preseason. Actually, I think it was the, the the second preseason game where he decided not to stand for the national anthem. He actually already done it once, but nobody noticed it. The second time he did it, finally a reporter notices, "Hey, you know, somebody from in the press box notices." doesn't look like Kaepernick is actually standing for the anthem. You think about it, fans, uh, you know, before this most recent bit of attention put to the national anthem, starting with Colin Kaepernick, and even through most of the NFL season last year, uh, when you watch games on TV, except for the Super Bowl, uh, and I think maybe the, the, the Thanksgiving Day games, perhaps, uh, your regular games on Thursdays and Sundays, though, uh, and even your playoff games up to the Super Bowl, they don't show the national anthem. The national anthem is not a big deal. It's something you see in the stadium, but it's not something that they show on TV because it's done a few minutes before kickoff. Um, and generally, I mean, you know, a few minutes before kickoff, kickoffs are right at one o'clock on Sunday, one and four or four fifteen. So before the one o'clock kickoff, you know, at twelve forty-five, twelve fifty Eastern time, you're still. Um, you're still watching the pregame show if you're watching anything, getting ready for the one o'clock kickoff. 
uh, before those four o'clock games came, same kind of thing. You're probably watching the the games leading up, the finishes of the games leading up to those second round of kickoffs, and then, you know, the Sunday night game, eight thirty start. You know, maybe the first game of the season they'll show uh, the, the the anthem singer, but generally not. I mean, generally it's something that you you know take for granted that that's there, but you don't see. So Kaepernick doesn't stand for the anthem. Uh, he's one guy. Uh, uh, eventually, he's persuaded by someone who reaches out to him who served in the military. Hey, don't don't not stand. How about kneeling? Kneeling would be a more appropriate way to to get your point across because Ka- Ka- Kaepernick is his his modus operandi here is to draw attention to racial injustice. That's what his that's what his uh, approach that's what his end goal is here. Bring bring attention to racial injustice uh, by by saying that you know this this. You know the, the attention paid to the national anthem to the flag is something that he wants to say. You know, America is not complete. America is not whole, and and he wants to bring attention to to racial justice issues by by take, not not taking for granted what everyone else does, which is stand during the anthem at attention. And I say everyone else, folks who've been to games know this. And actually, if you want, if you watch at home, when you watch a national anthem at home. We put so much attention on whether or not Colin Kaepernick and others now uh, are standing at attention during the national anthem before a football game. Admit it. Raise your hand. If you're watching this, if you're listening to this at later, if you're sitting at home watching the anthem before a game, pretty sure you're not standing with your heart over your hands, uh, over your, uh, hands over your heart uh, with your hat off. If you're watching at all, you're watching. If you're at a game, now a lot of folks obviously at games, uh, you, you know, the fact that they have to remind you to take your hat off and stand for attention tells you that a lot of folks don't pay attention. You know, I'm usually in the press box for football games. At basketball games, though, I do a lot of, I mean, obviously as a sports writer, uh, National Anthem is part of my life to a great degree and has been for the past 20 plus years. Uh, uh, so at football games, you know, you don't hear it very much because in the press box, you're kind of separated from the rest of the population, if you want to say. But at basketball games at the John Paul Jones Arena, the press section is um, very close uh, at John Paul Jones Arena. It's very close to the concourse, uh, the lower level concourse at JPJ. And it never fails that there are people during the anthem walking either to their seats or to concession, concession stands. There's, in fact, a concession stand right behind our media section. Those sales go on. People are still buying stuff. They're still haggling over stuff. They're still talking. Uh, there's a din of noise uh, behind you that is ongoing. So the fact that you know there, there's maybe 25 30% of the audience, if, if it's not even much more than that, that are not paying attention to the anthem at a game uh, as it's being played before the game. And yet now the fact that someone is not just, you know, players on the sideline are not just walking around talking to each other um, like a lot of folks are, whether you're watching at home or you're you're watching a game at the arena or on the field or at the stadium, uh, but actually doing something with a purpose to try to get attention and raise, raise discussion of an issue – all of a sudden, that's a cardinal sin in some people's minds, and it's only a cardinal sin because I hate to say this now, uh, the the reason people are objecting, I have to say, is it's you know you can say as much as you want to, you can say that it's because he's disrespecting the flag or he's disrespecting the anthem, but I just told you, and you know this to be the case. If you've ever been to a game recently or any time in your life, you ever been to a live sporting event, you know that there are a number of people there who are not paying respect to the anthem for other reasons other than you know social injustice and trying to bring attention to that uh so it's not about it's not about the act of not standing for the anthem with hand over heart singing the words it's it's the cause it's the cause and um people don't like you know and, and i know that there are a number of people out there who say gosh you know what I turn on the game on Sunday, uh, Saturday. Baseball season's every night. Basketball season can be can be any night. I turn on the game to get away from the politics. And I'll tell you what, I, I I'm there with you. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a jur- I mean, I'm, my, my my journalism career is bifurcated. I I am a sports writer, have been for 22 years, but I'm also a politics writer, and have have done that for a long, long time too. 
And uh, as a journalist who covers politics, and I've hosted news talk shows on radio and TV, um, you know, after the most recent presidential election, I had to quit cold turkey for a long time, and I think it was probably up until July, maybe sometime mid-July, before I could even turn on one of the news channels because I just couldn't take it anymore. You know, the way the back and forth, you know, the CNNs and MSNBCs and Foxes of the world, they – they, you know, the way they book these shows, they'll have a Democrat on one screen, you know, they'll have the one part of the screen is the Democrat, the other part of the screen is the, the Republican, the Democrat says Democrat things, the Republican says Republican things, they don't listen to each other, they, they squawk, they yell at each other, they call each other idiots, and then commercial break, we, we start again, and, and that's hours and hours of that. I couldn't do it, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I would rather have the Weather Channel on uh, during the day. Uh, to hear about temperatures or rain or not rain, I mean that's that's what I'd rather hear anyway. So um, so I'm there. You know, I can understand sports as a diversion. Um, and you know if that's if that's your objection, I you know I you know I I can't be upset with you with that. But if sports are your diversion and then you're saying oh I'm going to protest and not watch them anymore, uh, you know I don't know. I, I guess uh, because once the game starts. It's a game, right? Once you know, once the game starts, there's no people kneeling, there's the arms locking thing or whatever uncomfortable thing you don't like. It's not there anymore. You know, it's a game. I like to say this because I provide, uh, you know, I, I offer <laughs> insight and analysis into how games are going to be played out, uh, both here uh, on Augusta Free Press on Facebook, but actually I've I've been working with. Um, uh, I've been doing ESPN three broadcast college baseball and college football the last couple of years. Uh, you know, part of what I do is is uh, is is point out that you know the there's an old military axiom actually about um, no no well laid battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. Uh, as far as that goes, you know, uh, no matter what we do uh, in terms of getting ready for a game, once that ball's kicked off, because since we're talking about football here specifically right now, once the ball's kicked off, it's a game. Uh, you know, we talk about bulletin board moments, players being motivated by what coaches say or what players say in the other locker room leading up to a game. That all goes away once the ball's in the air, because you're at that point you're 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 executing, you're calling plays, you're blocking, you're tackling, you're trying to to win the game. And then afterwards, all that stuff matters. And of course, it matters to us in the stands. It matters to to broadcasters, right? We like to talk about what we talk about, but. I say the same thing about you know, if you're if you're really upset about the anthem protest, I mean you can certainly you can you can turn the games off. Um, you cannot watch them anymore. You can there's other things you can do on Sundays. There's a lot of things you can do on Sundays and th Thursdays, Sundays, and Monday nights. There's a lot of things you can do. Uh, you know if you like sports, there's it, it's the height of baseball season. Playoffs, it's almost playoff time in baseball. It's kind of fun. I, I love baseball. A, I told you I'm a baseball and football broadcaster. There's a lot of ways you can spend your time with sports. Uh, there, you know, if it's not sports, you know, I'm looking at my weather forecast before I got on this podcast here, and great weather forecast in Virginia this weekend. Get out and ride a bike. Go walk your greenway. Go uh, walk your dogs. Uh, go out to a local brewery or winery or something. You know, go to if you if you're so inclined, go to church and stay there. You can spend your extra time at church. Maybe you can go out and do some good things for your community. You can go shopping and take a nap <laughs> if you work too hard during the week, like I do. Uh, you know, there's there's a million. You spend time with your family. Call your mom or dad. Go see them if if you still have them. I don't. Uh, there's lots of things you can do. You don't have to watch football. There's no there's no requirement of that. If you and it, you know, if you enjoy football though, and what you're trying to do is make a political point yourself that's up to you that's up to you you know if you're if what you're saying is i'm not going to watch football because those guys uh you, you know they're kneeling during a protest you know but you love football you're punishing yourself and then also if you're if you're saying that but you're still sneaking a peek at the games and there's quite a few people who do that i mean I, same people i see on twitter saying you know they don't like the football anymore then they're commenting Either later that day about how the Steelers did this or the Eagles did that or whoever. Uh, yeah, you know, you're still watching the games. Admit it. It's okay. Um, I mean, there's a lot of reasons not to watch NFL that, in my opinion, have nothing to do 
Well, they have nothing to do. It's not my opinion. They have nothing to do with whether or not all the players stand at attention during the national anthem. You know, th- this is a sport that is in peril for lots and lots of reasons. Uh, the CTE issue that the NFL has been sweeping under the rug the past hundred years, but we've only really known about it for about the past ten. The fact that the players are out there hitting the heck out of each other, they're bigger, they're stronger, they're hitting each other in the head, and um, you know have long-term issues as a result. That's something that should have us concerned. I mean, you know, I'm, I've been a football fan. I'm a football broadcaster, and I still I, I sit in the, in the press box as I'm calling a game and think about some of the hard hits I see and what that's going to mean for that young man's life. Um, that should be something that gets your attention as a as a fan. That, that's you know, I'll bring an analogy in from. I'm also at folks who who watch regularly, listen regularly, read Augusta Free Press regularly know that I've worked uh, off and on in the pro wrestling business for the past seven or eight years, um, and I've been a fan of pro wrestling all my life. And I watch. I recently sat down on the WWE Network has a, a lot of archive material, which is great, fabulous. I've re- if you're a wrestling fan at all and you don't have WWE Network, get WWE Network. It's something very much worth your your time, energy, and 9.99 per month. Uh, I was watching one of the old ECW shows from obviously back 15 years ago or so, and I was a big ECW fan back in the day. Loved the East, you know, Extreme Championship Wrestling, the former Eastern Championship Wrestling, which was what I was getting ready to say. And but boy, watching it now from a 20 perspective, 2017 perspective, you know, seeing guys hitting each other with baseball bats and chairs without protection, you know, not not sticking their hands up in front of the chairs. Unprotected chair shots, guys going through tables, flying off of uh, balconies and hitting each other. I mean, the, just just seeing what they did to entertain me, I feel guilty. And, of course, a lot of those guys are dead now, and that sucks. You know, those guys will be in their mid to late 40s, maybe 50s in some cases, and they're dead. And uh, you're seeing the same thing in football now. Um, and you're seeing people... I mean, you, know, you you may yourself do this, but you certainly, if you don't, you see people on Facebook and Twitter and elsewhere say, "Boy, you know, they're they're really taking the game away by taking all these big hits out." You know, why don't you let them go out there and play? You know, it's easy for folks to say who don't play the game, who aren't around the game, who aren't around these people when they're out of the game, to say, "What well, you know, what do you want to do? Put dresses on them?" Uh, because they're real people. And the, those hits are really hard hits. I mean, there's a reason, you know, WWE doesn't allow chair shots anymore. Uh, there's a reason that the NFL penalizes guys, throws guys out of games, suspends guys for egregious hits uh, to the head, especially. Um, because in the end, you know, they hopefully these guys live life afterwards. And... <sighs> That's what that should be something that gets your attention on Sundays. And if if the NFL is not doing a good job in dealing with the, the long term health, short term and long term health of their players, that should be a reason that maybe you flip the channel and don't watch the games. And I'm not telling you not to because of that reason. I'm just telling you that, you know, that's that's a valid reason. Um, another valid reason will be that the games themselves have gotten boring, and not just gotten boring, in my opinion. You know, the way the NFL has played itself the last. 10, 12 years maybe dating back, you know, the, this enfor- – I, I call it enforced parity. Uh, you know, with the salary cap, uh, the hard salary cap that the N- NFL has that that makes it really hard. I mean, you know, I was a real real big fan of the game, and I'm sure a lot of you folks were too back in the, say, the 70s, 80s, even in the 90s when the NFL – before the NFL had any salary caps, um, uh, when teams could build up – their rosters maintain the the core of a roster for a long period of time, uh, and and thus develop consistency. They could, you know, uh, I'm thinking of the Niners teams of the '80s. You, know, you had Joe Montana, you had Jerry Rice, you had John Taylor, you had boy, I'm trying to think, Ronnie Lott, of course, on defense, uh, Roger Craig in the backfield. I mean, you know, th- those guys played together for a long, long period of time. And you just built around that. The Redskins of the 80s, you had Joe Theismann at quarterback. You had John Riggins at running back. You know, eventually some guys 
would would cycle in and out. But you know, Dexter Manley was there for a while. Uh, th- transferring over Daryl Grant, the Hogs offensive line, those receivers led by Gary Sanders and uh, uh, Art Monk, uh, among others. Uh, you know, the the continuity of the NFL back in those days was was part of. You know, you knew who every year going out who they, who they were going to be you know you knew, you knew if you're rooted for the Niners you rooted for Joe Montana if you rooted for uh the Skins it was Joe Theismann for the you know if you had if you were a Giants fan it was Phil Simms and his group uh, Lawrence Taylor and uh uh reasons at linebacker I'm trying to think of some you know the other guys there Phil McConkey at receiver you know the Cowboys and Danny White I mean, you know, there was marketability with that because it was there was stability. You know, roster stability led to marketability, led to when you beat the Cowboys, it meant something. When you beat the Redskins, it meant something. Well, now from year to year, the NFL changes so much. You know, your your favorite players, your favorite teams, uh, you got you know guys are, are are jettisoned for roster reasons, for for not wanting to pay them reasons, uh, and. You know, beating beating the Cowboys one year might not mean much because that particular Cowboys team with and the, the other side of that too is the 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 schedule where, um, you know they they try to balance it out and say okay if you're 13 and three one year you win your division you're gonna play the toughest schedule in your division and the team last place in your division is gonna play the weakest schedule because what we like to do is have everybody still in the playoff hunt the last week or two of the season because that means more fan interest well that's what they think but what it also means is you know, everybody's playing to sort of the me, you know, there's, there's really, except for the Patriots who've been able to keep together the core of guys because for the most part, guys like Tom Brady, well, he's the, he's the, st- he's the stability piece of that roster. Uh, but he's been willing to take pay cuts over the years, uh, to, you know, give his, his, his team roster flexibility, uh, to go out and get guys they need to, to plug holes. But for the most part, you know, there's a question every year. If you're a Redskins fan, is Kirk Cousins going to be my quarterback next year? Uh, you know, is you know the quarterback play being so paramount in the NFL? Uh, so that's an issue. But then, yeah, that 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 the, the scheduling parity. Uh, it just means everybody. The NFL would prefer it if everybody was eight and eight. And if everybody's eight and eight, <laughs> what does it mean to beat somebody? You know, and if everybody's eight and eight, I mean, if if Jacksonville's got as equal a shot of making the playoffs as the Cowboys or the Redskins or the Patriots, and of course that's not the case, but I'm, you know, the, the actually Jacksonville's looking pretty good so far this year. Uh, if if it if it's if everybody can make the playoffs, is there any value to making the playoffs? I mean, look at what NASCAR did over the years too. I think NASCAR's made the same mistake. You know, the dating back to I want to say it was 2004, 2005, the Car of Tomorrow, when they equalized, standardized the the rides that the guys are in. Uh, they they de-emphasized the the brawling nature of the guys. You know, basically guys would be hauled off on the trailer. Uh, suspended quickly if they if they were to engage in the sort of hijinks that the Kale Yarbroughs and the Richard Petties did back in the 70s. That's what made it interesting, by the way. Not only uh, the the fact that certain te- hey, the, yeah certain teams have advantages, no question. Uh, just like in football, certain teams had advantages. Uh, you earn those advantages, and you have to still play with those advantages. Uh, but when they went to let's let's have everybody have a chance of the, that victory circle, that's fine. But it's not because everybody's equally talented. It's because they're all driving in the same car, and all of a sudden, you know, it's it's just boring, you know. And I'm someone who I wouldn't call myself an NASCAR fan to say the least, but I did grow up in a family of people who are race car enthusiasts. <laughs> yeah. I I am the outlier as far as my my DNA tree goes. Uh, my father, a couple of uncles, uh, cousin, all drag racing at the local drag strip. Uh, and then, you know, that drag strip also hosting Saturday night oval track races. I mean, come on, this is, it's in my DNA. It skipped my particular part of it, whatever, but you know, it's there. And so, you know, I, I've, I've covered NASCAR races professionally. Uh, and the last one I covered in Richmond, uh, about a year and a half ago, um, uh, I mean, a hundred thousand seat venue that had maybe thirty thousand people for the weekend. Uh, you know, NASCAR couldn't 
accommodate all the fans they had 15 years ago, they've 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 pissed it away. Uh, that's a reason to turn the TV off. The NFL is going in the same direction. Uh, also, there's an issue, especially from a, a in-person fan attendance standpoint. Boy, I cover games. <laughs> I get to sit in the press box. Thank God I get to sit in the press box for games. Because the last time I went to a game and sat in the stands, um, this is a college game, it was 2011. Had my press pass, decided it was a Virginia-Virginia Tech game. The winner of the game would win the ACC Coastal Division. And my wife, I'm a UVA grad, my wife's a Virginia Tech grad, and we decided we'd watch the game together. I gave my press pass to an assistant who uh, works with me here at Augusta Free Press, let, let him have all the fun in the press box because I wanted to watch the game from the stands be able to cheer. Well, of course, you know, Virginia hasn't won that game in 13 years. They lost that game that day pretty bad, 38 nothing. But, you know, aside from the beatdown on the field, what I'll never ta- never forget about that game was just how atrocious it was to watch the game from the stands. Uh, the the fighting, the just continue the foul language. I'm not someone. I'm a, I'm a, I can cuss like a sailor too, but man, in public, the foul language for hours and hours of it. The the and I'm not one who's a teetotaler. I I, I certainly enjoy alcohol, but again, in public. In a stadium where alcohol is not even allowed by name, you know there were people passing out. There was a person who fell on my feet, th- throwing up, laying there as a pile of vomit. And I'm asking the ushers, "Hey, can we, you know, maybe get some medical attention for this young man?" You know that's the case across college and, and pro stadiums, football-wise, across the country. It's just disgusting that. The live experience is taken away from a lot of us who don't want to see that, who don't want to be – not even not see it. And I don't want to say that we're so offended by that that we don't want to see it. You just don't want to be a part of it. You know, you got to drive to the game. You got to pay to park. You got to sit there for hours. You got to go through security to get to the, your seats. And then you sit there for hours, and people are throwing up at your feet. They're cussing each other. They're threatening to beat each other up the whole game. Uh, it's, it's, it's not fun. Um, so you sit at home and you watch it at home and it's, you know, then you don't have to worry about all that stuff. Um, you know, that, those are reasons not to watch a game. Those are, there's lots of reasons not to go do things, uh, that have nothing to do about whether or not the athletes are using their positions, um, as athletes to, to draw attention to whatever their cause is. And so I'll come, I'll, I'll cycle back to that now because, I clearly uh, am, a, am an advocate for that um, that line of thinking. I, I'm someone who thinks that people who have more uh, have more responsibility, um, and that's whether you're an athlete, a celebrity, or just a, a person who's whatever level of wealth you got. I think there's a responsibility. If you've gotten yours, I think you need to help other people get more towards theirs. You know, I guess lack of a better way of putting it and uh so you know and i and i mean this i i i say this for people who whether you're standing up for the causes that i specifically believe in and what colin kaepernick's doing to raise issues with racial justice social justice i support what he's doing there i think that and 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 i and i look at what he's doing to um say um uh bring attention to you know if 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 you're trying to bring attention to whatever you're trying to bring attention to and he's he's doing it with the national anthem um if 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 he were to wear you know of course if he tried to wear a patch on his uniform the NFL probably would not allow that uh right away um because they control those uniforms because the NBA for example this year is actually selling um uh Selling advertising space on uniforms. We've seen some, some oh, certainly NASCAR has done this for a long, long time uh, on the driver of the fire suits they wear. But we've seen soccer teams in Europe, and I think maybe MLS here in America started doing that. The NBA is starting to do that now. So, yeah, you, you said the patch wouldn't work. Um, the NFL will find players for sock issues. So, um, aside from pulling a Marshawn Lynch and not talking during uh, – Either not talking or using your 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 media required media time to talk about what you want to do. The thing that can get people's attention is 
something on the field. And as I said, when the ball's up in the air, you don't do it then because you're, that's that's your job. But before the game, you know, that's 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 certainly time that that's that's there. Um, I would say this, you know, I, we've, we certainly heard, and I'm, you know, we may be having some folks watching, and listening right now, saying, well, if you if the NFL can find them for not wearing their socks the right way, or if they were to put a patch on and then get, you know, find them for that, why don't they find them for for you know kneeling during the protest? And the NFL, I mean, they could do that. I mean, it's, I know that there'd be people out there say that's a First Amendment issue. It's not a First Amendment issue. First Amendment says the government can't prohibit you from exercising your free speech. If the NFL were to find a player for taking a knee during the national anthem, that wouldn't be the government doing it. That's where perhaps Donald Trump saying the NFL should fire guys for not doing this steps over the line a bit because Donald Trump saying they should do it kind of does put government into the mix there. But if the NFL were to do it, you know, it's a fine, right? Guys get fined for lots of things. Uh, guys get fined for not doing their media responsibilities. Um, Marshawn Lynch, for example, uh, the Super Bowl from a couple years ago. Uh, guys get fined for not wearing their socks the right way. Uh, guys get fined for bad hits during a game. So um, find them, right? Uh, you know, I'm someone who studied the history of the civil rights movement under Julian Bond at the University of Virginia. A guy, Julian Bond, the late NAACP president, uh, who was uh, an active active uh, leader of the civil rights movement back in the 60s. So I learned from someone who actually, you know, didn't just study in a book, but actually was was an active participant. And one thing he emphasized when he talked about the civil rights movement was you have to be willing, and this dates back to not just Martin Luther King, but Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, and his protest movement in India as India was fighting to gain its independence from Great Britain back in the 40s. Uh, civil disobedience isn't protesting and, and expecting not to be sanctioned for your protest. I mean, think back to the American civil rights movement of the, of the 50s and 60s. A, a tactic of the civil rights leaders was to actually encourage uh, protesters to stand up to authority to the point of, of risking being arrested and being arrested and being put in jail to stand up for their rights, to show the injustice of the system. And so, honestly, folks, if if you think that the advo- what what you advocate, if 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 you're on this side of the issue, to say guys should be fired, they should be fined. If you fire guys and fine guys, you're only going to add more substance to what they're going to do. I mean, I I, I think maybe folks might think, well, they're not going to give up their multi-million dollar contracts, their livelihood for this. But one, those guys who make multi-million dollars actually have theoretically some money in the bank right now and um and two i mean again you add more fuel to the fire if guys are are fired first off the the firing would be the akin to putting a protester back in the 60s in jail remember what happened when that happened the outrage of of water cannons being turned on little kids at the front of civil rights rallies police dogs biting protesters remember what that did that galvanized the Americans who who were sitting on the sidelines and saying, "Well, we don't really want to get involved in this, so we'll just be quiet and stay on the sidelines," that that turned them into, "We have to do something about this." You fire people for standing up for what they believe in, you're going to get everybody off the sidelines. You're going to get everybody off the couches. So that's not going to be the solution to your problem. Now, the fine might be the less egregious way to go. But it's still going to have the same effect. If you're going to sanction people, whether or not it's government sanctioning free speech, if you're going to if you're going to penalize people for uh, standing up for what they believe in with with monetary fines, even that level is is still going to uh, is going to turn some people who right now are are sitting on the sidelines quietly into more active participants in this. So, um, I think you know, to me, the 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 solution to this is. It's not going to happen uh, because this is not the way our country works. But the solution to this, to me, is that somehow we all recognize right or left, whatever. You, and I don't like – I hate saying people on the left or people on the right because I saw something the other day on Twitter, and it talked about people on the left. And I thought to myself, I'm just a guy who thinks certain things. So I'm not a person on the left. I don't take my marching orders from anybody else. I just think the way I do. Um, and I'm, if you're a person on the right, you, you the same thing. Eh? You know, you think the way you do. You don't, 
you think the way you do because you think the way you do, not because somebody told you to think that way. I understand that because I, 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 I shudder at those, at those, at that nomenclature as well. But if we could all just come together and say, hey, you know, Kaepernick raised his issue. Um, Others have st stepped up with him. Michael Bennett from the Seahawks being one. Malcolm Jenkins, and Malcolm Jenkins with the Eagles being another, who are prominent in doing this, and saying, you know, let's let's think about what they're saying. You know, I'm, we're not going to change it right away. I mean, they're they're saying, they're, you know, the, it started because of the number of of high profile deaths of of African Americans at the hands of police. Um, that's what initiated the the initial protest uh, led by the one man crew of Colin Kaepernick. Uh, but if you if you just acknowledge and say, hey, you know what he's saying here is that you, you know maybe we are, we're supposed to th not be comfortable in thinking that that's something happening to somebody else, but it's happening to all of us. I mean, I'm going to bring a Martin Luther King quote into the play here and say, and this is something I believe, and I wish that more people would would take to heart and believe as well that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. You know, if if for me here in my comfortable life, I've got to, again, I'm sitting in, you know, my home office in a, in a, in a nice little studio that I've been able to build for myself. Um, you see, you know, you can see just from where we are, if you're watching this broadcast uh, on Facebook Live, I've got stuff on the walls. I mean, God, I'm, I'm doing well. Um, I get to drive down the street, and if I'm pulled over by a cop, I'm not thinking first off that, you know, if if I have a busted tail light, that something bad might happen to me. That something, you know, that that uh, if I say one word out of place, or if I make a sudden movement to re reach for my wallet to get my driver's license out, that I might get shot. Um, I'm saying that that's the experience for for Black Americans in this country. Whether you want to acknowledge it or not, that is the experience. I was talking with a lady the other, the other day at a, at a press event that I was I was at uh, that involved local police, and she said her son, who's 12 years old is scared of police. Um, and of course, the police officer she was talking to, actually a, a, a local police leader was saying, well, that's because the media portrays certain things. I didn't interject, but I wanted to say, no, it's not because that's the way media portrays certain things. That's the perception that is there for, for has been there for a long, long time. And fair or not, that's a perception that we need to address. And so that doesn't affect me. Again, when I'm pulled over for going five miles over the speed limit or if I do have a busted tail light, you know, I, I get I get more benefit of the doubt certainly for being a white guy than I would if I were an African American or if I were Latino. Um so yeah, is it's not it's not something that a lot of us want to acknowledge, but it's true. And all 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 the folks, Colin Kaepernick and the others, who are leading this movement want to do is get you to acknowledge that. And the fact that so many people are, are are not not only failing to acknowledge that that's what all they're trying to get you to pay attention to, but instead of that saying, for for standing up and saying that you should be fired, you're only adding fuel to that fire. And so this is going to go on as long as people continue to react um, in 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 the the lack of civil discourse way that we do everything in this day and age. That's that's just that's just reality. I mean, it's not enough to say uh, I don't support Hillary Clinton in the presidential election. It's lock her up. It's not enough to say President Trump was wrong to take a couple of days to forcefully reprimand verbally the white supremacist who uh, acted the way they did at that Charlottesville rally back in August, it's to demonize him. I mean, we all do this. And um, the solution is, yeah, you know, kumbaya, let's all listen to each other and things of that nature. But uh, that's all this is going to, this, that's all this is. And you know what? The, the, the toothpaste is out of the tube now. And I can guarantee you this, it's not going to stop. It's not going to stop, uh, and so the solution is going to be you can stop watching the games if you'd like. That's that's certainly your right. There's lots of reasons to stop watching the games. I enumerated those earlier. Um, 
But that said, you know, there, you know, you can punish yourself. You can punish the NFL if you want. You can punish NASCAR. You can punish the NBA, Major League Baseball, MLS. You can do whatever you want to do. You can punish Hollywood. Don't want don't don't go to movies. Uh, don't watch any TV either. Uh, the internet, gosh, Facebook, man, I, I, Facebook, I understand is liberal. So. Uh, at this stage, you know, you can live like it's 1858 and, and be happy with yourself um, or simply acknowledge that other people don't have it as good as you do. And that if there's if we're allowing injustice to occur to some people in some places that threatens us down the line, you know, I kind of will close this with something and I'm not going to quote it word for word because I don't have it written down in front of me. But uh, I visited a Holocaust Museum this past summer uh, on a visit to D.C., and if you ever get to D.C., you live near. If you live in Virginia, a lot of our viewers, readers, listeners, uh, live in and around Virginia. It's only a couple hours for most folks who who are, uh, I'm sure, in Virginia to get up to D.C. Definitely recommend you, if you've never been to the Holocaust Museum to to, to take that tour. Uh, it won't be pleasant either. It won't be like going through the, the the Air and Space Museum or anything like that. It won't be ooh and ah. It'll be, oh dear Lord, we let people do this to other people. But when you leave that that venue, there's the the, the famous uh, quote on the wall from a gentleman who was uh, eventually interned in um, one of the death camps um, who was not Jewish, um, who says something to the effect of uh, when they came for you know the trade unionists, I didn't speak up. When they came for the Jews, I didn't speak up. It didn't affect me, basically. It goes down a long list of people who, when the Nazis came for them, I didn't speak up because that wasn't me. But eventually, they came for me, and there was nobody left to speak for me. Now, this guy survived the Holocaust. He survived his time in a concentration camp and actually uh, had been an early supporter of the Nazis, uh, historically, um, I was surprised to learn when I looked that up later. But um, I spent the rest of his life as a uh, uh, speaking um, uh, as an anti-war pacifist, and uh, you know his own experience, unfortunately, um, just cementing that if you don't speak up now about injustice being done to African Americans, if you don't speak up now about injustice being done to Latinos to the LBGTQ community, to women, uh, to those who don't have health care insurance, uh, to those suffering from the opioid crisis. And this is, you know, this is something that affects people in, in states that voted for President Trump in the election. You know, tens of thousands of Americans caught up in the opioid crisis. And white communities, white rural communities – in Appalachia, in the Midwest. And the reason they're abusing these these opioids, these drugs, these pres prescription drugs being used outside of what they're prescribed for, is because in so many rural communities in our country, there's no hope, there's no jobs, there's no opportunity, there's no reason to think that there's a good reason to wake up tomorrow morning. So you heal that, you, you try to heal that with, with drugs. We're ignoring that crisis. I mean, you know, Take a knee for them. Take a knee for all these people. You know, there's injustice being done in lots of ways. There's a we can be a more perfect union. We can always be that way. Acknowledge it. Just acknowledge it. That's all. That's all anybody's asking you to do. That's all I'm asking you to do. So for that, hey, positive stuff here, right? Uh, it's Thursday. UVA football is off this week. We talk on, on our podcast awful lot about UVA football, so we'll take a break this week on that. Uh, get back to that next week as the Cavs prepare for Duke. Uh, I often talk a lot as well about VMI football. I uh, have done VMI football on ESPN3 a couple times this year. Uh, they're on the road this weekend, back in Lexington next weekend, so I should be back on a broadcast uh, again next weekend. We'll talk some VMI next week. I still owe folks who are wrestling fans a wrestling podcast. Uh, I'll sort of do – I think we'll do that tomorrow. We'll review the No Mercy. We'll look ahead to Hell in a Cell. Good time to do that, right in the middle of the two. And uh, we'll see what else we can get into. Thank you for, for listening today, for watching today. If you stay with me the whole time, man, thank you. It's, we're like, what, now 50 – almost 50 minutes into this, in, into this particular uh, 
uh, podcast, live Facebook. So thank you for sticking with us. And um, want to thank you for your patronage of Augusta Free Press. And uh, hope you continue to do so even after I've lectured you for 50 minutes about your social responsibility even when you're watching sports and listening to podcasts. Have a great day, everybody. Signing off, Chris Graham.